Hello. Oh, hi, Louise. You made it. It's really good to see that you're here. I hope today's uh, been an okay day for you. Um, I've made a little list. In fact, I hope everybody has had a really uh, okay day. The weather here um, where I live. Uh, hi, Julia. The weather here where I live has been absolutely horrendous all day long. It's just been awful. Um, I've got my puppy here. Hi, Carmel. I have got my little puppy here sitting on my knee. I'm hoping that she is going to stay asleep. Um, ben is doing really well. Uh, hi Matt, it was uh, a bit of a shock to her little system today. We went out for for a little walk um, and it was very cold and wet, but she managed okay. Um, I'm sure when she's a bit older she'll love going out in the cold and wet. Um, she's a spaniel. So I've made a few little notes so that I don't forget um, what I want to talk about tonight. And uh, thanks for joining in. I'm not going to go on for too long because I don't want to take up loads and loads of your time. Um, so hi, if anybody watching doesn't know me, I am Tracy and I run Best Dog Learning and Stuff and the only the whole thing is just me. Um, and I am starting now, I gave up my job last week i had a uh, worked as a data analyst for a wealth management company and i gave up that job last week to work full time in this business because i want to do more with it and i was finding it difficult to have the time so now that i've typically up until now been doing one course a month and uh, but this month i'm going to do four things uh, because i've got a lot more time so the first thing that i'm going to do is an online tricks course which is the third i've got a little series of them and this is the last one in the series and these are tricks courses that are intended for people with reactive dogs so you might not know um anything much about me but my very first dog was a bull mastiff he was a male bull mastiff i'd never had a dog before i decided that male bull mastiff would be the ideal dog it wasn't at all a good idea i really wouldn't recommend starting out with dogs with a bull mastiff they're not particularly easy on the whole but anyway i did and calgacus in adolescence became very aggressive towards other dogs and i started to learn a lot about dogs to help him get over his problem which he did one of the things that really helped was learning tricks so what we did he worked to music we didn't just do trick training we did he work to music which is just tricks strung together and put to a piece of music so i so i taught him and i had another bull master katie i taught them both lots and lots and lots of tricks and i found that some of them were really helpful for calgacus in terms of getting over his issues with other dogs and i know there are loads and loads and loads of tricks courses out there and um, lots of dog trainers doing tricks but my focus is not just on teaching the dogs things that look good um, or that you can show off to your friends. My focus with tricks is teaching things that are useful when you people are out and about with their reactive dog. Because some of the things I learned were, were really quite transformative for Calgacus. So I've got, I've got a, a series of all the tricks that um, I found most useful and I've put them all together. And this is the last stage of that. So I'm, I've got six tricks. The course is going to last for three weeks, and I'll give we'll do two tricks a week just to give time to practice in between. So one of them, and I always like to talk about why I'm teaching something. So one of the the first one that I'm going to teach is four paws up on an object, and um, the reason for four paws up on an object is well there's a few reasons so so that sort of stationing behavior which is what animal behavior experts um oh i'm glad to hear that louise so that sort of stationing behavior where animals are taught to go and stand on something 
um, is really common. Animal behaviour experts use it a lot, and particularly if they're trying to work with groups of animals, if they can get them all to stay still in a particular spot, it can help to cut down on conflict and, and that sort of thing. So it's used quite widely. But with dogs, so there's a few, there are really a few uses. Um, dogs often seem to really like climbing up on things, so it can be good for their confidence. But even if what you're teaching them to put their four paws on is a blanket, it doesn't have to be a raised platform, although well, raised platforms can make it easier. Um, so years and years ago, I went out to see a family who had a German Shepherd, he was a lovely dog. But the issue that they were having with him was they lived quite rurally. And the issue that they were having with him was that if a delivery driver arrived and, and what delivery drivers would do was they'd drive into their yard, they'd park their van, they'd get out of the package. And if the family weren't watching, they had a massive big garden and they tended to have the back door, the door open a lot so that their dog could go in and out. But if they weren't watching when a delivery driver arrived, he would rush out and really quite aggressively bark at them to try and chase them off and they were worried that somebody was going to get bitten and also they were worried that the delivery companies would start refusing to to bring things to them i mean certainly the royal mail will if if there's dog bites they will just stop delivering to that property so th so the family were understandably concerned so i went round and i showed them how to teach the dog to station to just put his four paws on an object and stay there. And I can't remember what they used now. I can't remember if they used a little raised bed. Um, they may well have done. Anyway, I, I showed them how to do it and they practiced and they said, oh, and the next time I went back, they said, it's totally fine now. He, in fact, we don't even have to tell him anymore. When he hears the gate opening, he runs in here and he gets on his spot and he just stays there. So it can be a useful trick for that. I found I teach pretty much I teach all of my dogs to stand on mats and to lie on them, um, blankets and towels, a whole load of things. And I have found that really useful for vet visits. Um, the little uh, Staffordshire Bull Terrier Roxy, who I adopted um, only about four and a half years ago now. Ro the very first time I took Roxy to the vet, she was so difficult to handle that I thought. I was thought, thank goodness she was meant to be a foster dog, and I thought, thank goodness that this is a foster dog, because I, I wouldn't want to have to go through taking her to the vet every year for vaccinations, and I cannot imagine what it would be like if anything happened to her and she was injured in any way. So thank goodness she's a foster dog, and this isn't going to be my problem. And then I adopted her. And anyway, one of the things I've done for vet visits is, because she's really taught quite a lot to sit or lie on a mat I just take it down to the vet with me whenever we need to go and and just, I think just because it's familiar Roxy just gets on it and it's much much easier for the vets uh, to treat her and she has had some some quite awful things happen to her she once was um, body slammed by a, a much larger playful dog and it shattered one of her canine teeth completely shattered it um, she had to have a massive operation to remove the the shards of tooth from inside her gum she was in a lot of pain and she needed quite a bit of aftercare so we were often down at the vet and the vet was often wanted to look at a, a very painful area and actually she coped really well and the mat helped so that's why four paws up but the other things that, I'm, that are in this course um, is walking backwards um, going round behind to switch from one side to the other, a sustained chin rest, a recall to, to a hand target, and going through going through your legs to switch sides. I, I like side switching in my experience. It's very useful uh, if you have a reactive dog, being able to get them to go to the other side of you uh, can often make all the difference if there's something uh, in your vicinity that you would rather not um, them not encounter. So that's the first thing that I've got coming up this month. And the next one is another course. It's a six week online course and it's a muzzle training course. So I have noticed, I've spoken to a lot of people about muzzle training. So often it's one of those things that dog trainers say, 
oh everybody must muscle train their dog you never know when you might need it um and and often people don't think they need to muzzle train their dog and something happens and a muzzle would be really useful and at that stage they then are trying to get a muzzle on a reluctant dog because the few dogs will just be happy to have something put on their face straight away so then people are in a bit of a quandary because they need the dog to wear a muzzle all of a sudden and the dog doesn't want to so i really do recommend muzzle training when you don't need it when your dog is fine that's when to muzzle train because there's no pressure then so this is a six week course i use some t-touch in it some clicker training in it and i've got quite a lot in it about um to help support the people because my experience is that um we have quite a big problem with muzzle with muzzling our dogs it's often quite traumatic i know that when i used to muzzle calgacus to stop him biting other people's dogs um i i felt absolutely sick the first time i left the house with him wearing a muzzle it was just it felt like the worst thing ever and i know that lots of people feel the same way so i've included things to help with with the human element of it and the mindset and i've also because i've got a new dog in the house i've bought a teeny little muzzle um for the puppy she's a working cocker this is probably still too big for her she's 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 really really small and i'm going to work my way through uh, the course with her and train her to wear a muzzle as well because although i obviously hope that she won't she won't need one and nothing will happen to her that would necessitate her wearing a muzzle i you know i can't predict the future so i'm going to muzzle train her like i would any of my other dogs so that's the second thing and then the third thing i'm introducing a new thing i've always done um online courses where I put the content on my website for people to join in to look at. I have a Facebook group and I'm changing things up now that I'm fully employed um, by based on learning and stuff. I am, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's difficult. Louise muzzling can be, can be really difficult sometimes. So I am adding in short workshops and the way these are going to work is I'm going to run them. Um, I'll do a webinar on the Monday night to present what, what you can do, then give everybody a week or so to train. And for people who have bought handler places on them, they can submit videos to me. And then we'll have another webinar at the end where um, I can give feedback and a few pointers to help move on if there's if you get stuck in any way i think it's a really effective way of learning and really nice about giving feedback on ever say anything horrible to anybody uh, so it's not to give feedback as in criticize it's to be able to give a bit more support so what i'm going to do for my very very first uh, workshop week-long workshop is the use of a pop-up umbrella for um to create a barrier a portable barrier so one of the things that people always do when you when you walk with a reactive dog so little roxy my staffy she can be quite reactive to a range of things she just generally is quite an excitable dog and her response uh, is to is to bark if she gets excited so often and, and, and everybody I know with reactive dogs tends to do the same thing if they're working their way through it is if I see something coming that I think she'll bark at I will look for a barrier to get behind so the other day I was out walking her and I saw um, a, a, a guy I sometimes see he's got this really beautiful young Rottweiler and um, I knew um, yeah yeah caroline oh and for muzzles i would always use like a basket style like this because the soft mesh ones um they they can't always pant as well in them and if they can open their mouth enough to pant they probably could eat rabbit poo so yeah one one like this is is always what i would recommend but i would it, there's more about that in the course um so um, so barriers are really really helpful um for a range of things so with this rottweiler she's a beautiful dog 
and but what she tends to do is when she sees another dog she stares at them quite hard and she'll raise her tail a little bit and she's a wee bit stiff and I knew that Roxy would bark at her so I always avoid Roxy seeing her and as we were walking down the street I went you know I'll just go into the pub car park because there's a wall and she won't be able to see this dog as she passes by and that's great if you're somewhere where there's lots of barriers where you can go behind a parked car or behind the wall or behind a tree but sometimes there's nothing sometimes there's absolutely nothing that you can use as a barrier and if that and and if it's a real if it's if it's really difficult if you've got a dog where if they see one of their triggers they are really upset about it and you end up having to abandon walks and go home and they need to stay in for a wee while to help them calm down then having a barrier on you is a really useful thing pop-up umbrellas are amazing for this they are absolutely amazing um and i mention them a lot to people and often what people say is well you can i mean you could scare your own dog with a pop-up umbrella they could be really frightened by it which is absolutely true but you can teach them not to be and i've got a really nice broken down way of teaching dogs to be okay with their owner holding an umbrella and popping it up and, and using it to create a barrier so I was first taught about this um, when Calgacus became really aggressive towards other dogs. Uh, pretty much all of the dog trainers I knew and spoke to at the time said there was absolutely no hope for him that he would remain that way for the rest of his life. And what I needed to do was make sure that he didn't ever come into contact with anybody else's dog ever again because he was so dangerous um, and he did really badly injure a dog. So, he, you know, the this wasn't a, a groundless accusation and one of the things that a trainer was, gave me was to use a pop-up umbrella and it was great advice but what she'd said was if a dog is running over to you because this is one of the real things for where reactivity is about other dogs one of the things that's really challenging is to how do you manage your dog when you're outside and you look up and there's a puppy or a young dog or or, or an over friendly dog running at you and the owner's shouting on them or maybe isn't sometimes people aren't that worried about it um and, and but the dog is not responding to being called i and, and is dead set on coming over to you and so what the trainer said to me was if you use a pop-up umbrella if you carry one with you and if you pop it up as the dog approaches most dogs will just run away because it's a really weird thing for them it's not something they would they would generally come across and most dogs will just run away from something that's that unusual and she said and if they don't you can use you can keep the umbrella between you and the oncoming dog until the owner comes and gets them and i so I started carrying an umbrella because it was absolutely vital that Calgacus was not approached by other dogs. He found it really, really, really stressful. And also, although I was muzzling him, he was a he was a really big dog. And what worried me was that he could, do you know, if it was a small dog, even him muzzle punching with the muzzle on would be enough to really injure it. So I uh, carried an umbrella and I made absolutely sure that other dogs didn't run over to Calgacus until it was okay. Um, and that meant I didn't have those frustrating experiences that, that people often have where they're out walking and a dog runs over and it undoes months and months of training. Uh, that just didn't happen to me because I made absolutely sure that dogs weren't running over to us and the umbrella was really key in that. So this workshop is about how to teach your dog um, to be okay with um, you using a pop-up umbrella because I think they are invaluable. The trainer that I spoke to did talk about it in terms of oncoming dogs but actually I, I think they're a great barrier for if something that I, I used it a bit when I was when I was doing some filming for a course when we were standing next to a field with sheep in it. Roxy used to be really really excited by sheep and it, it was helpful to have the umbrella there just to cut down on um, the amount she could see the sheep. So, and the last, the last thing that I am going to do in February is do a webinar, um, just a one-off 
webinar for an hour or so um, that people can ask questions at. And I'm going to talk about um, predatory aggression. So this is slightly unusual. It's a bit of a contested term. Is it aggression or is it not? But typically, um, this, this, this sort of thing is characterised by the dogs being silent um by by grabbing um and it's often very sudden it seems to come out of the blue and the reason that it's not always considered to be aggression is because it's you know it's thought to be m about food finding behavior a little bit so it's it's considered to be a little bit different from your normal sort of reactivity or aggression that's about usually aggression is about creating space getting either getting something to stay away from you or from the dog or, or or them getting to keep something that they want it's usually about creating space but with um predatory aggression that's not the case it's more about closing space and and getting close and and and, and grabbing onto the target now it is a completely different part of the brain. It's physiologically very, very, the two types are physiologically very, very different. And that's why there's a bit of a debate. But I always think, do you know, if dogs that are grabbing and potentially killing, I mean, I would consider that to be quite an aggressive act. If um, something killed me, I would consider it to be aggressive no matter what, well, killed somebody I knew obviously if I was dead I wouldn't consider anything but if somebody I knew was killed was murdered say I would consider it to be an act of aggression no matter what the underlying motivation is so I kind of feel as though it's something that you can either argue either way but what what has interested me is I um, I'm studying for an MSc in Applied Animal Behaviour and Training right now and I've done a couple of assignments where um, I have looked um, at predatory behaviour in dogs and what I've found is that what's, what seems to be the common knowledge among dog training professionals and among people who live with dogs doesn't match up with what the science actually says. So Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that in the webinar and share some more insights and some useful information about that sort of aggression, because in my experience, it's it's people find it much more difficult to deal with, and um, and and it is a bit of an interest of mine. So that's what the webinar is going to be about, um, and that's everything that I'm doing. Oh, Caroline. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's really, it is really tricky when people sometimes just appear out of nowhere, and 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 sometimes the dogs do come over. So yeah, it, it, I mean, I don't, I don't carry an umbrella now. Although Roxy can be a little bit reactive, but she, she doesn't get into a complete state about it. She might just bark, but it, she calms down again really, really quickly. Um, but if she was going to be upset about it, I probably, I probably would just to make sure that I could keep her safe from the potential of oncoming dogs. Cool, cool. Well, I will let everybody know when, um, I, when I've got all of these. I'm working on my website to get them up ready uh, for people to join in to buy, to buy them, and uh, I will obviously let everybody know when when these things are available. Now, does anybody have any questions at all before I finish up? I'm very impressed that this puppy has a yeah, I did actually. I did used to. Um, I, I used to have a carabiner, and I would attach my umbrella onto my belt. It must have looked quite, you know, must have, it must have looked potentially a bit odd, but it, but <laughs> but I, but I was happy to look slightly odd 
um, in, in a quest to protect Calgacus from uh, potentially negative experiences. And it did, I mean, it, there, I did a lot of things with Calgacus and I obviously don't know exactly what helped, but he completely got over uh, his problems with other dogs. In fact, he was the only dog I've lived with that I would deliberately take to, there's a country park up the road from me where um, people go to with really young dogs and the walking etiquette in that park is that everybody just takes their dogs, lets them off the lead and if they approach each other for a game that's absolutely fine. So it, it's a place where you can pretty much guarantee if you go there that a young dog is going to come running over and try and, and, and have a, want to have a game with the dog that you're with. And uh, Calgacus is the only dog that I've taken there regularly as an adult because he loved it. He he, he absolutely loved it. If if a young dog charged at us from miles away and, and really wanted to play with him, he thought it was the best thing ever. Um, my other adult, my other dogs as adults are not so keen, not so keen to be approached in that way by unknown dogs. Um, Yeah, so Julia, do you know, I think muzzles are a really, really good idea if you are worried. And, do you know, I would use both, actually. A muzzle might help you feel more confident. That's often the case when we go out. If we know that our dog can bite an oncoming dog, it can increase confidence. But the flip side is, you need to still make sure that you protect your dog because they now can't they, they can't they can still bark and lunge which often is what chases dogs away but um it is important to keep protecting them because so i have seen um it's common at dog like in the summer not in covid times but normally in the summer when they, you do have these big charity dog show type events um then what I often see if I go to them is um, some is a couple of poor dogs going around wearing muzzles, looking really worried and, and being confronted with lots and lots of other dogs. So I would probably do both, use an umbrella and, and muzzle train. Um, yeah, yeah, do have a go at that, Louise. Um, it may well uh, really help. Particularly if you've got that the motion detector as a bit of a cue, that could, you could it's potentially he could learn to go to his bed um, when he when he hears the motion detector. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do you know I think a lot of dogs who are muzzled are muzzled to stop them eating um, rubbish when they're out on walks. Particularly if they eat things that make them ill. And yeah, and often people do want to give them treats and. Um, dogs often can't say no to a free treat so yeah muzzle training can be really useful for um for the, that sort of thing as well i mean it is the it is the kind of thing where not all dogs who are wearing a muzzle are wearing a muzzle because they might be aggressive a lot of them are, are wearing it because um they, they might eat something that would make them ill oh oh i think i've seen pictures of the rottweiler that you used to walk caroline maybe um oh do you know? Do you know what really interests me is when I so I muzzled um, both of my bull mastiffs at different times in their lives. I muzzled Calgacus because he was really aggressive to other dogs, and I muzzled Katie um, because I, she developed inflammatory bowel disease, and eating things off the ground would make her really ill. So I used to muzzle her um, after she developed that to make sure that she couldn't um, eat anything off the ground that would make her really unwell, and like nobody stayed away from us. I, I was really fascinated. People would come over, would see the dog with a muzzle on and come over to ask me why they were wearing a muzzle. And I was I was once in my local park with Katie and it, it, possibly these people were too far away to see that she was muzzled. But there were people in the park who were puppy walking a guide dog puppy. Um, and he ran over to Katie to say hello. She's wearing a muzzle. Um, lovely, I mean, she liked young male dogs, so that was perfectly okay by her. But I was kind of like, you've got no idea why she's wearing a muzzle. She could have really scared that dog. Um, so, yeah, 
interesting. It's interesting that experiences are, are so different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's easier if if people can stay away. And Louise, you've done a really great job of telling everybody in your local area about Charlie, so they they know that he has got some concerns and that he might bark a bit, and they know to to stay away. So I think you've also done a great job of publicising, um, and getting getting the people who live in your area on your side to help you out with Charlie. Okay. Right, I'm going to wrap up there because that's um, half an hour I've been talking to you for. So I will wrap up there and um, and I, I will contact everybody uh, by email or and on this page as well to let you know um, when when these things are available to buy. I'm still working on that uh, and. But hopefully it will be done. I will be done soon. No, hopefully I will be done soon. Um, yeah, so, do you know, Caroline, just before I go, these style, the, there are two kinds of Baskerville muzzle. There's these, um, and there's the Baskerville Ultra that Louise will be able to show you a picture of, because I think you've got one for Charlie that are black and they're broader. So the Ultra ones are better for dogs like Charlie, like like the bull breeds with wider faces, and these ones are better for uh, dogs with narrower noses. That's why I bought this style um, for the puppy because she's got a narrow little face. And also, also the other things that are really useful um, for dogs that are slightly yeah pointier is you can buy really nice greyhound and lurcher muzzles that are are quite brightly coloured. I bought a couple for when I was when I was recording the muzzle course. I bought a couple for Cullen and Roxy um, because so what I did was I trained them using the method that I was using for the course to make sure that it would that it would work. Well, look, she's awake now. She's really sleepy though. Um, she's really really sleepy. She's looking at me and her eyes look exhausted. Um, no, it's it, honestly she's she's quite hard when she wakes up. She tries to climb up around my neck. I had a I had a call that um, Carmel and Barbara were at, uh, at the, for the end of a course last week, and she was trying to climb up around my neck. So <laughs> so so she can be quite quite difficult when she wakes up if I'm trying to talk to people on the computer. <laughs> So yeah. Um, anyway, thank you all for coming along. I will wrap that. I will wrap this up there. And yeah, yes, indeed, Caroline. I, I will take my puppy outside to go to the toilet because as soon as they wake up at this age, you need to go straight outside. <laughs> so I will go and do that. Have a really great evening, everybody, and I will speak to you all again soon. Thanks for coming along and chatting to me. It's been really nice to see you all. Bye for now.